My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Today is September 2nd, 2021. We are here today with Susan Rosenberg for an interview to augment the exhibit, Monmouth County, 9-11 and its aftermath. This interview is being recorded with the permission of all participants. Susan, can you just confirm for me that you do indeed consent to the recording and that you understand this interview will live in the public domain? Excellent, yes, indeed. Thank you. So tell us just a little bit about your early life. When and where were you born and raised? I was born in the Bronx. And as soon as an apartment came available in Asbury Park, my parents moved us here. We rented um, three rooms on 8th Avenue in Asbury Park, which turned out to be the home of Margaret Potter uh, to be. And that's where I grew up. And then my parents bought a house in Wanamassa and I inherited that and that's where I am now. And around what year roughly was that, that you moved down to Asbury? 1949. Okay. And tell us a little bit about your educational background. Okay. I was a fine arts major and went to Fairleigh Dickinson University. And then I went to the University of Michigan where I got a museum and library studies degree, master's degree. Okay. And now I'm volunteering in Asbury Park, the Asbury Park Historical Society and Asbury Park Museum. I'm on both boards. Wonderful, so busy, busy. <laughs> did you use those professional degrees in your work life or did you go on to do something else? Well, I became a photographer and I became an academic librarian at Brookdale where I worked for 41 years. Oh, okay. And I used various skills there, my photography, and I was in charge of exhibits and displays at the college for three years. Okay, wow. So let's bring it up to the month of September 2001. Where were you living at that point? Were you in Wanamasa? Were you working at that time? Give us a little context. It was a work day. And my shift that night in the library was two to 10. So I happened to be having breakfast early in the morning around 8.30 and things and I had the TV on and things started to happen. And interestingly, one of the first interviews that was coming on was about a man who observed a low flying plane that hit the building. Now they were waiting for the cameras to go downtown. That's all they had at the time. So they kept asking the same man, the same question, maybe in different ways. Yeah, it was low <laughs> and yeah, it was unusual. And that went on for about 10 minutes until they finally got the cameras downtown. Mm -hmm. So I observed, I was there to see everything happen. Mm. And my neighbor then joined me. He comes over, it was around nine o'clock. And he said to me, you know, people are in there. And, you know, we were just seeing the building at the time. And it was, it, it was numbing. It was a numbing experience mm. to witness. It was unbelievable. A lot of people said you almost couldn't comprehend as you were watching what was unfolding. Did you feel any of that? Absolutely. Well, I felt the numbness and that I, it was hard to process because we still didn't know why. There were still controversies. Well, did it just hit? No, it was definitely terrorism. Mm -hmm. So you sit there and you wonder, you know, you, you don't know. And it's a feeling a lot like these days. Sometimes you just don't know. <laughs> You know your home, you know your day, you know yourself, but in the outer world, it's the unknown. Mm, such an important point. So how long did you stay there in front of your TV? I guess till about 9.30. And then I decided I didn't have to be, like I said, to school until um, two o'clock. I wanted to see if I could see anything by going to the coast, to the shore because I'm a mile and a half inland. So I drive along Ocean Avenue and I'm in Seabright and I'm heading toward Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. And I climb the wall that's there and I see the smoke. This was the aftermath. I see the smoke at the bottom of Manhattan. 
So then I proceeded and just before Sandy Hook, a friend of mine named Frank Brooks had a restaurant called Something Fishy. I decided to go into Frank's restaurant. And by the way, you know, people were in school or they were at jobs. There wasn't traffic. There wasn't people around. So I'm in his restaurant. And by the way, there was another a couple there and they had seen people jumping and they the husband was saying, you know, I'm telling her we saw it was people. She couldn't believe it. And it, we we're all in, in, a, in, a, in an uproar. So Frank and I are chatting and no sooner were we there when all of a sudden someone from the Red Cross comes into the restaurant and says, Frank, Mr. Brooks, we need food for the volunteers on Sandy Hook. Who knew? Okay, so Frank gathers hot dogs and hamburgers and drinks, and he and his wife went in a van and they were heading to the site on Sandy Hook. They were following the um, Red Cross vehicle. So I said, do you mind if I go in my own vehicle and follow you? So that's what I did. We go to a site and I guess there was tables set up and I don't remember if, there was some kind of building because people were coming across, they were being ferried mm -hmm. from lower Manhattan. They had no cars. Their cars were in the um, stations, the bus stations and the train stations, which are now closed. So they came in white, they had powder on them. They had to be hosed down. And so the Red Cross and the Catholic charities their volunteers automatically knew how to handle those people. And so they did. So I go to the table and I'm saying, well, I'm a librarian and a humanitarian. What can I do to help? You, you want to do something in that situation. So they said, you can be a transportation worker. So um, that's what I did. So for the rest of the afternoon, we'd those several of us would stand around the table. And when somebody was ready to go home, um, they'd say, well, who wants to take this person to Avon? And that was my passenger number one. I, he was an insurance person. He had come up from South Carolina and he was situated at the time um, in a building next door, actually. And I'm taking him to Avon. Now he's not even from New Jersey. And Part of this, we're in the car together, we're about 45 minutes, and how do you handle a person who's in shock, you know, who's in this situation? So I thought, well, maybe if I drive through Asbury Park and show him the stone pony. <laughs> it's true, I did that. Um, but he's on the phone, and he's calling his colleague who was one, in one of the upper floors, and he was getting no answer. No answer. Call after call try after try. So, you know, there it was right in our midst, the situation. So I took him home. He called his wife in the South and he said to her, you know, this young lady is taking me uh, to where I'm staying. And that was that. I went back to Sandy Hook and it was later in the day now. And this one man he, he was an, he lived an hour north, good hour, right outside of Manhattan. And so who wants to take him? And nobody raised their hand but me. I didn't mind. It was an hour. Glad to take the man. So we're in the car and it was very tense. I didn't know whether to put the radio on. And I, I did for a while, but there was these, um, what do you call these, uh, different commentators speculating. It, it was very unpeaceful. So we, we actually drove in silence. When I took him home and I pulled up in the driveway, there was his son in the window. His father got home. I hung my horn. You know, it's just a natural thing to do. And the man said to me, can I give you money for gas? <clears throat> and I said to him, no, we're family. Oh. That's just how I felt. It's just, we're all together in this. So um, I went back to report to Sandy Hook, our base, Catholic Charities and the Red Cross. And that was it for that day. And that night when um, <clears throat> I went to bed, 
um, I had a radio on and I don't know what station it was, but they were thanking the Catholic charities and, and everybody. And do you know what they said at the very end? And we thank and appreciate the transportation workers. <laughs> it's such a unique and important role you fulfilled that day. And I, I think people probably wouldn't think about that, you know, in, in the greater scheme of things, but it's such an excellent example of how the community came together. You weren't supposed to be there that day, right? I, and who but knew what, went. what to do, you know, when you think at your home, so it worked, it uh, unfolded well for me to be able to help. Let me ask you just a few follow-up questions. So, you just went to the shore, which I love because I find in doing oral history interviews with the citizens of Monmouth County, whether it's about hurricanes or disaster, they go to the shore, that something pulls them to the coast. It's really fascinating. After the hurricanes, yeah, to see yeah. the waves. Yes. So at some point in your travels, did you hear if Brookdale closed or do you check in with Brookdale because you were supposed to go to work? That's right. I did. And and I thought, this is an, an event that I'm aware of, and I never thought Brookdale would be aware of it. They were going on with classes. When I arrived at campus, everybody was leaving. They closed the school down. And interestingly, in weeks to come, there was a, um, oh, a consultation room that was set up, and I asked somebody, what's that for? And it was for anybody wanted to talk, because Middletown lost the most people of any place, mm. Middletown, New Jersey. And there we were, at Brookdale served that community. Yeah. Now, when you link up with the Red Cross, did they have you do any registration paperwork? I mean, anything, or was it just, you're here, get to work? I, I'm not, I don't remember clearly. My guess is I might've, I, I can't remember. Okay. That's fine. I remember um, seeing a sign, excuse me. I remember seeing a sign though, uh, hanging. And I said to myself, boy, this would make a good picture. And it was who can give blood because mm. that would have been needed. Oh, and by the way, I want to say this and route to the shore when I had left my house and there was no traffic, there were ambulances and um, fire trucks all lined up on side streets, just there waiting for any possibility. Mm -hmm. It was freaky. And in Long Branch, the hospital sent their ambulances out. It, it was a sight to see, yes. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. I was thinking of my students um, and for them, it will be wild to consider that there was no GPS in 2001, right? I mean, so were you using maps or you were just navigating? Oh, to go to the people's houses. Well, they gave me the directions. Yeah, so uh, it wasn't needed. Okay, actually, it wasn't needed. And then you found your way back. Okay. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, you also noted that it was difficult when you had these people in your car to to know how to react. Right? What could you do? How should you behave? Do you remember if the Red Cross or Catholic Charities gave you any tips on that before it was just too rushed, right? On my own, yeah. Yeah. Just play your humanity by ear. Yeah. Just let it play out. Use your instincts, yeah. So that first day you made two trips? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you that's volunteered right. for the long one, so that took up a lot of time. Yes, that's correct. And it, and it was later in the day by the time I got there, so... Yeah somehow yeah that's wonderful um do you remember their names by any chance no nope. i was curious if you had ever you know tried to look them up or anything it's it's so but in the heat of the moment in the rush of the moment right i i don't i guess there was email then was there yeah probably uh it wasn't as i i think we weren't thinking in that way yeah. we we're so into the moment yeah. Oh, it's just so interesting. Um, after that first day, did you keep in contact with the Red Cross or Catholic Charities at all? Or was that kind of the end of your experience with them? 
that was the end. But one little sidelight is um, I was a member of the Professional Women Photographers in New York City. And of course, we went to work the next day. And I had one friend in particular who was sending pictures. And I would print them out, um, print them out. And it was, she had walked from 95th Street down to Manhattan, Catherine Steinman. And she took pictures of people holding up signs saying, missing, have you seen such and such? And they were prolific. I know someone personally who couldn't, hadn't heard from her son in three days mm -hmm. for some reason. Uh, I don't know why, but he had hoofed it up north. Uh, he had he ran when he was told to go back up into the towers, go back to your workplace. Everything's fine. And he she told me he said, well, he saw people running, so he wasn't going to go to his office. He felt that was the right thing to do. So she lost touch with him for three days. So here now I'm getting in my office pictures right from Manhattan. And that was the situation. I, I could feel it down here in New Jersey. People were missing. In fact, I went into this lower Manhattan in weeks following, like within two weeks. And that was what billboards were filled with, missing, missing, missing. What brought you into lower Manhattan in the weeks after 9-11? Um, well, I was the editor of the newsletter for the professional women photographers, and we kept meeting and we had the newsletter to put out. Okay. Wow. In fact, I remember something very distinctly. I was walking to where I had to go, and there was this man on the street, a younger er, man, and he said, hello. Now, here we are in New York City. People don't say hello. Mm -hmm. But that, again, was the feeling of, of those days. We're all one, we're all family, we're all connected in this situation. Do you remember too, kind of an intense patriotism in the aftermath of 9-11 or no? I wouldn't call, for myself, I can't say patriotism, but I will say this, I do travel a lot. I'll be going to country number 73 oh in November. Wow. And I've been to all the continents. So what did change for me personally was the TSA uh, regiment. Mm -hmm. Transportation Security Administration put in place at all the airports, all the security measures mm -hmm. which are with us today. And that was, I guess, the biggest impact I experienced. Mm. Do you think it's important that people remember 9-11? Hmm. I was thinking about that. Um, you can't help but remember 9-11, just like people remember the Holocaust and they'll remember Afghanistan. Hmm. But I think what it boils down to is in this world, there's good people and there's not so good people. And we're all in every era throughout history, you always have your good and the, and the bad. Mm -hmm. And you just hope that the, the good prevail. Mm -hmm. And we are all, it's our fellow man. You know, it, I'm in disbelief to know what, how countries can hurt their own people and et cetera. But I guess we just want to, hopefully humanity brings out the best in people. Do you feel like 9-11 changed you in any ways? I don't know. The reason I don't know is because of all the things that have happened since mm. in the world. We're so aware. <laughs> Ethiopia, the starving people, um, the, the disenfranchised women who uh, the domestic violence in the countries and all over. Um, not I'm that made me even more aware, but there's but I'm never unaware of all the bad going on at all times. Aww. It's sad. I, I feel guilty. You know, I I'm very grateful to have a home and to have positive and to have a positive attitude and a positive life. And I'm just so aware of the people who don't. Yeah. And I, one thing I'm doing though, 
for Afghanistan tomorrow, I'm going to make up um, toiletry kits. And there's, these people are going to take whatever is donated down to Princeton. So I'm going to be part of that. And I helped Haiti. I had a Monmouth County wide initiative 10 years ago when they had their first earthquake. I worked at the time. So at Brookdale, I got people to donate and we sent goods to um, the container ship that was going down to help Haiti. So now I'm going to help Afghanistan and in that way. And I also belong to an organization it called Together Women Rise. Mm. And every month we help a grassroots group somewhere in the developing world that are helping women and children, whether it be giving them money or teaching them not to cook in a pot in their huts. Mm. Uh, and the domestic violence, I'm aware of that among poor people. So we are, hel I'm helping in that way financially every month. Oh, Susan, it seems you have a true humanitarian's heart, no matter what the crisis. <laughs> Thank you. Before we wrap, are there any other memories from September 11th, 2001 that you would like to share? I think I've hit them all. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, you so much for sharing your experiences. This is a really unique role that you fulfilled that day. And I'm glad that we could share it with others for the historical record. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Melissa.